Yo, what's up, everybody? Professor V here, and this is the lecture for Chapter 7, Mood Disorders and Suicide. Let's go. Disorders are disturbances in mood that are serious enough to impair daily functioning. The DSM-5 does not include a general category of mood disorders. Rather, mood disorders are now classified in separate categories called depressive disorders and bipolar and related disorders. Major mood disorders discussed include major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder. Two major types of bipolar disorders described are bipolar disorder and cyclothymic disorder, also called cyclothymia. Many of us, probably most of us, have periods of sadness from time to time. We may feel down in the dumps, cry, lost interest in things, have trouble concentrating, expect the worst to happen, and maybe even consider suicide. However, for most of us, these mood changes pass quickly or are not severe enough to interfere with our daily lifestyles or ability to function. This is what separates sadness from depression and mood disorders. I watched myself in mingled terror and fascination as I began to make the necessary preparation. Going to see my lawyer in the nearby town, there rewriting my will, and spending part of a couple of afternoons in a muddled attempt to bestow upon posterity a letter of farewell. It turned out that putting together a suicide note was the most difficult task of writing that I had ever tackled. Late one bitterly cold night, when I knew that I could not possibly get myself through the following day, I had forced myself to watch the tape of a movie. At one point in the film, the characters moved down the hallway of a music conservatory beyond the walls of which from unseen musicians came a contralto voice, a sudden soaring passage from the Brahms' alto rhapsody. This sound, which like all music, indeed like all pleasure, I had been numbly unresponsive to for months, pierced my heart like a dagger. And in a flood of swift recollection I thought of all the joys the house had known, the children who had rushed through its rooms, the festivals, the love and work, the honestly earned slumber, the voices and the nimble commotion, the perennial tribe of cats and dogs and birds. All this, I realized, was more than I could ever abandon. And just as powerfully, I realized I could not commit this desecration on myself. I drew upon some last gleam of sanity to perceive the terrifying dimensions of the mortal predicament I'd fallen into. I woke up my wife and soon telephone calls were made. The next day, I was admitted to the hospital. A distinguished author stands at the precipice of taking his own life. The depression that enshrouded him and that nearly cost him his life, this darkness visible, is an unwelcome companion for millions of people. Depression is a disturbance of mood that casts a long, deep shadow over many facets of life. Mood states can be conceptualized as varying along a spectrum or continuum. One end represents severe depression and the other end, severe mania, which is a cardinal feature of bipolar disorder. Mild or moderate depression is often called the blues, but it is classified as dysthymia when it, is, when it becomes chronic. In the middle of the spectrum is normal or a balanced mood. Mild or moderate mania is called hypomania, and is characteristic of cyclothymic disorder. Major depressive disorder can be diagnosed when there is an occurrence of at least one major depressive episode in the absence of a history of mania or hypomania. There are several features of a major depressive episode, or MDE, including a depressed emotional state that includes persistent periods of feeling down, sad, or blue, evidence of tearfulness or crying, and increased irritability or loss of temper. Another feature of, of an MDE is the feeling of being unmotivated, having difficulty getting out of bed in the morning, or just getting your day started. 
Reduced level of social participation and social withdrawal as well. Loss of enjoyment in hobbies and other pleasurable activities. A reduced interest in sex and failure to respond to praise awards. There are changes in functioning and motor behavior in an MDE. This can be moving about or talking about or talking more slowly than usual. Changing of sleeping habits, whether it be sleeping in too long or waking up too early. Changing in appetite, whether it be increased or decreased. An increase or decrease in weight and failure to meet responsibilities and neglecting physical appearance. Lastly, there are cognitive changes in an MDE. This can include difficulty concentrating or thinking clearly, negative or thinking negatively about oneself, feelings of remorse or guilt, of past misdeeds, lack of self-esteem, thinking of death and or suicide, or even psychotic behavior such as hallucinations and delusions. I feel like I'm out of my mind, something like that, and everything was black because I maybe I, just, uh, I did not eat, I did not sleep. When I eat, it's like uh, I don't have an appetite. It's like it's, uh, it's sour, yeah. I can't taste the food. I can't. Even if it's uh, like uh, my favorite, my favorite, I can't, can't taste it. When you were feeling depressed, how did that affect your energy? A week. I'm very weak, and like my uh, my my arms and my what call this bones, it was, it's like trembling and very very weak. Even I walk when I walk in the streets, I feel like it's I it's empty. I feel like it's empty. Yeah. I I shout you no, know? um I I took a pillow and then to my bed. As if I'm crazy, because <laughs> if not, I don't know. I even, you know, I kneel and then put the pillow on my face and then I shout, so nobody will hear me. <laughs> I'm ashamed. And then put the pillow. On. <laughs> Did you understand that that you were feeling depression? I feel like, like I was, I was already lost, like something like that, and and I know what. I don't know what to do. Sort of one generalization that we can make is that there is a tendency to sort of value more um, seeking help for more medically related. Um, so it would be more acceptable to go to a medical doctor than perhaps to a psychologist or to a mental health center. It, and it could be, you know, for families that are tradition, more traditional, there might be an aspect of shame depending on sort of the, you know, what their view is of mental health. My doctor told me to go to a psychiatrist, but I did not go. Uh, I just asked some medicine from her and she gave me a, like a sleeping pills before. There are several risk factors that are associated with major depressive disorder, which include age, as the initial onset is most common among young adults. People lower down the socioeconomic ladder are at greater risk than those who are better off, financially anyways. People who are separated or divorced have higher rates than married or never married people. And women have higher rates. About twice as many women as men seem to be affected by major depression, but the reasons for this gender difference remain unclear. The greater risk of depression in women begins in early adolescence, approximately ages 13 to 15, and persists at least through middle age. People with a family history of major depression and those with a childhood history of sexual abuse are also at higher risk. Now these are risk factors, not a guarantee that someone that falls into one of these categories are going to suffer from depression. It just has been shown in many scientific research studies that depression is correlated to these factors. Persistent depressive disorder is a form of chronic depression lasting at least two years that is milder 
than major depression, but may nevertheless be associated with impaired functioning in social and occupational roles. The feeling of being down in the dumps occurs more often than not, but is still not as severe as depression experienced in major depressive disorder. This affects about 4% of the general population at some point in their life. Those who have a major depressive episode superimposed on a long-standing dysthymic disorder are said to suffer from double depression. In the DSM-5, persistent depressive disorder is also referred to as dysthymia. Bipolar disorder is a commonly known psychological disorder, but widely misunderstood. Many believe that it's just someone, that if someone is in a normal mood and then becomes angry, this is bipolar disorder. This is not necessarily bipolar disorder if the anger was a justifiable response. Bipolar is a psychological disorder characterized by extreme swings of mood, and changes in energy and activity level. The swings of moods occur in a fashion that is the complete opposite to the extreme side of a spectrum of emotion. This could be the heights of elation to the depths of depression over the span of a few weeks or months. There are cases of bipolar disorder involving mixed states that are characterized by episodes of both mania and depression. During mixed states, a person's mood may rapidly shift between mania and depression. So, if Shelly were to be having severe mood swings from extreme elation and hyperactivity to major depression, one moment she feels like she's on top of the world. The next moment she feels really suicidal. She is probably suffering from a bipolar disorder. There are two general types of bipolar disorders. Bipolar 1 disorder and bipolar 2 disorder. Bipolar 1 disorder is identified by the occurrence of one or more manic episodes, which generally, but not necessarily, occur in persons who have experienced major depressive episodes. In bipolar 2 disorder, depressive episodes occur along with hypomanic episodes, but without the occurrence of full-blown manic episodes. Manic episodes are characterized by sudden elevation or expansion of mood and sense of self-importance, feeling of almost boundless energy, hyperactivity, and extreme sociability, which often takes a demanding and overbearing form. People in manic episodes tend to exhibit pressured or rapid speech, rapid flights of ideas, and decreased need for sleep. Hypomanic episodes are less severe than manic episodes, and are not accompanied by the extreme social or occupational problems associated with full-blown mania. During a hypomanic episode, a person may feel unusually charged with energy and show a heightened level of activity and an inflated self-esteem self and may be more alert, restless, and irritable than usual. Such a person may be able to work long hours with little fatigue or need for sleep. So if Rico is having a normal day when suddenly he feels charged with energy and unusually alert, he knows when he gets these feelings he is capable of working long hours with little fatigue or need of sleep. He is still capable of using good judgment and has no hyperactivity though. He is best described as having a hypomanic episode. If he were not able to make good judgments and was very hyperactive, this would be characteristic of a manic episode. So bipolar 2 disorder is separated by bipolar 1 disorder and that bipolar 1 disorder includes the more severe manic episodes while bipolar 2 disorder is characterized by less severe but still dangerous hypomanic episodes. In the description of this video or above me right now, I will provide a link to a video of the television show Shameless which shows the character Ian that is portrayed as having bipolar one disorder. I was having just a really tough time keeping it all together, sort of, so to speak. I mean, as I'm pretty high functioning, I can I managed to be able to do things regardless, but it was to the point where I wasn't, I hadn't gone to class for a couple weeks, so my grades were falling, uh, I couldn't get extracurricular stuff done, working on shows and whatnot, I just had, I couldn't, do it and for the first time I couldn't 
I felt myself slipping and I couldn't keep it in any sort of check. It was just completely far gone. Um, like, I have to say, I fantasized about suicide, to be honest, like every four or five minutes. And I just was really miserable. So I was like, I can't do this anymore on my own, so I've got to ask someone for help. I tend to get depressed for a very extended period, maybe like seven or eight to nine months. And then I get hypomanic for a couple of weeks, which is normally enough so to the point where I can catch up on all the back work normally that I haven't done. And then I have my period of normalcy, I guess, before the cycle starts over again. When I'm hypomanic or manic, I'm fine. I can talk to people. I'm great, just like in that normalcy state. Uh, but when I'm depressed, I become really hermit-like, horribly introverted. I get nervous around people. Um, I become really paranoid in a lot of senses. So when I'm, for me, the depression is the worst part. Kind of what happens is you cramp in at the center, and I just I feel tight and then my shoulders feel weighed down and you feel like your blood's warmer than it is and you can feel it pumping and it's uh, and like you want to sp you want even when you speak you feel like your core the vocal cords are stretching like everything in you tenses up horribly and you take these just huge deep breath but everything just feels tight and compacted so you feel like you're sort of so you you feel like you, you when you take the bre a breath in the air expands in your lungs and you can feel it expand but you feel it like physically pushing heavy masses out to do so I f might get into the cycle where I'm like okay I'm depressed for no reason at all and then I start thinking of the most depressing things my mind can possibly fathom you know <laughs> all those great philosophical questions that have plagued man from the beginning and you start going, oh well, if there's no meaning to life or blah 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 or why are we here and you cycle those questions and you're like, this is ridiculous you don't have any actual reason to be upset or depressed and then you get frustrated, I then I get frustrated that I've got that on me, adding on me and so I, then it, a, a fair amount of self-hatred comes in because it's like, well, why can't I just feel right? Other people get along, you know, fairly decent, they don't have to they don't have this going on they can avoid these like mental traps that they're falling into and you sink deeper and deeper until then you s I start deconstructing myself and then all at once I just shut down sort of and I'm just in a horribly bad mood I don't want to be around anyone else I kind of just lock myself in my room for the most part when I'm really depressed I can sleep a 20 hour day no problem I can get up I can go I can get up be awake for two hours and go back to sleep the times I have actually been psychotic are when I was depressed and couldn't sleep. What happens when you enter a psychotic phase? This would probably be the first one and at the time I didn't really know. Um, we were actually home back in Trinidad and I was in a room with my mom in the guest room at my cousin's house and I had been depressed for a while and I swore the devil started talking to me. And he told me how he was going to kill, like, my family and my loved ones. And, like, I think at the time I just, like, begged my mom what to do. And so she was like, pray. I was like, okay, I'll try that. And I just, for the whole night, all I could hear was, like, this demonic voice talking to me. And Hypomania. Personally, hypomania is great. <laughs> I love it. If I could live in hypomania, I would. It's like being swooped up on a bunch of Red Bulls, uh, more than one, several. <laughs> and you're just flying all over the place, and you've got a ton of energy, and, but there's no crash. I, the best part was I was got hypomanic after I was depressed. So anything I was back, I hadn't finished, I could catch up on and get done. So I mean, like, I could write two or three papers at the same time while I, while I was researching them, you know, and do a ton of other things all together. It was, it was great. I mean, I didn't, I could, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, sleep, I only need 20 minutes and I'll be fresh. When I was manic, I painted my, one, one time, uh, I just painted my room and I decided it needed like to be repainted. So I pulled all my furniture out of my room and this had to be probably starting at midnight and completely repainted my room, put it back in and like the next morning and the next day I was like, no, I need to do it again. And I pulled it all back out and repainted it again. So I put two coats, I painted the room twice in a, a day and a half. 
when I'm hypomanic, I mean, it's a better lens to look at myself through. I mean, I don't think I'm like Jesus or God or anything, but you know, I don't come down on myself as hard as I would when I'm depressed. When I'm depressed, I definitely don't want to meet anyone I don't know already. But when I'm hypomanic, I can, let's work the room. <laughs> Hi, who are you? What's your name? Ah. My hypomania usually does not last long enough, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'll generally only have it for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, before, you know, I love a lot. I'm like a, a normal human being again who needs to sleep at night and can only do a certain amount of projects or things in a day. If I didn't take my meds, I wouldn't necessarily become hypomanic. I may become depressed, and I want to avoid that much more than I want my hypomania. I can take a Red Bull and have that feeling for an hour or two. Cyclothymic disorder is a type of bipolar disorder characterized by a chronic pattern of mild mood swings and sometimes progresses to bipolar disorder. Someone with cyclothymic disorder experience few, if any, periods of normal mood last for more than a month or two. However, the periods of elevated or depressed moods are not severe enough to warrant a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Although reported prevalence rates of cyclothymic disorder range from about 0.4% to 1%, it tends to be underdiagnosed in clinical practice. The boundaries between bipolar disorder and cyclothymic disorder are not clearly established. Some forms of cyclothymic disorder may represent a mild, early type of bipolar disorder. Although cyclothymia is more or is milder than bipolar disorder, it can significantly impair a person's daily functioning. Some research indicates that depression is often preceded by significant life stress. Stressful life events increase vulnerability for both major depression and bipolar disorder. Examples of sources of significant stress include the loss of a loved one, interpersonal struggles, physical illness, and economic hardship. Social support from family and friends may buffer the effects of stress and reduce the risk of depression. Social support from friends and family members appear to buffer the effects of stress and may reduce the risk of depression. People who lack important relationships and who rarely join in on social activities are more likely to suffer from depression. In classic psychodynamic theory, depression is viewed in terms of inward, directed anger. People who hold strongly ambivalent feelings toward people they have lost or whose loss is threatened may direct unresolved anger toward the inward representation of these people they have incorporated or introjected within themselves, producing self-loathing and depression. Bipolar disorder is understood within psychodynamic theory in terms of the shifting balances between the ego and superego. More recent psychodynamic models such as the self-focusing model incorporate both psychodynamic and cognitive aspects in explaining depression in terms of the continued pursuit of lost love objects or goals that would be more adaptive to surrender. In the humanistic framework, feelings of depression reflect the lack of meaning and authenticity in the person's life. For some, the focus is on the loss of self-esteem that can arise when there is loss or personal setback. Depression, more likely when personal identity and sense of self-worth associated with our social roles is lost. Learning theories focus on situational factors in explaining depression such as changes in the level of reinforcement. When reinforcement is reduced, the person may feel unmotivated and depressed, which can lead to inactivity and further reduction in opportunities for reinforcement. Cohen's interactional theory focuses on the negative family interactions that can lead family members of depressed people to become less reinforcing to them. Living with someone who is depressed can become stressful in itself, and the depressed person's partner or family member becomes progressively less reinforcing. This theory is based on reciprocal interaction, which is our behavior influences how other people respond to us and how they respond to us influences how we respond to them. 
This theory holds that depression prone people react to stress by seeking or demanding reassurance and support from their partners and significant others. At first, this effort to garner support may succeed, but over time, persistent demands for emotional support began to elicit more anger and annoyance than expressions of support. Although loved ones may keep these negative feelings to themselves, these feelings may surface in subtle ways that spell rejection. Depressed people may react to cues of rejection with deeper feelings of depression or and by making greater demands for reassurance, triggering a vicious cycle of further rejection and more profound depression. Next, cognitive theory focuses on the role of negative or distorted thinking in depression. Depression prone people hold negative beliefs toward themselves, the environment, and the future. This cognitive triad of depression leads to specific errors in thinking or cognitive distortions in response to negative events that in turn lead to depression. Cognitive theorists believe a person's self-defeating or distorted interpretations of life events such as tendencies to blame oneself without considering other factors can set the stage for depression in the face of disappointing life experiences. This is a list of the cognitive distortion I mentioned in the last slide. The tendency to magnify the importance of minor failures is an example of an error in thinking that Beck labels a cognitive distortion. He believes cognitive distortion set the stage for depression in the face of personal losses or negative life events. To keep the lecture short, please refer to page 269 to 270 in your textbook if using the 10th edition for full descriptions of each. You may also Google them. In time, I will make separate videos on each. The learned helplessness model is based on the belief that people may become depressed when they come to view themselves as helpless to control the reinforcements in the environment or to change their lives for the better. A reformulated version of the theory held that the ways in which people explain events, their attributions, determine their proneness toward depression in the face of negative events. The combination of internal, global, and stable attributions for negative events renders one most vulnerable to depression. According to reformulated helplessness theory, the kinds of attributions we make concerning negative events can make us more or less vulnerable to depression. Responding to the breakup of a relationship by internalizing, it's me, globalizing, I'm totally worthless, and stabilizing, things are always going to turn out badly for me, can lead to depression. Genetics appear to play a role in mood disorders, especially in explaining major depressive disorder and bipolar disorders. However, it is still not known which particular genes are linked to mood disorders. Not only does major depression tend to run in families, but the closer the genetic relationship people share, the more likely they are to share a depressive disorder. Yet families share environmental as well as genetic similarities. It has been seen in monozygotic twin studies that if one twin has the genetic makeup of the mood disorder, the other twin has a 50% chance at developing the mood disorder as well. Monozygotic or identical twins may share the same genetic information, but have different environmental experiences throughout life. Thus may be the reason why as to some develop it, and others don't. This allows us to understand the effects of the environment on the development of mood disorders. Researchers look at the environmental impact on fluctuations of certain neurotransmitters in the brain, such as serotonin, to determine how, to determine how the development of mood disorders occur. Brain abnormalities may contribute to mood disorders as reduced volume and lower metabolic activity in the areas of the brain involved in regulating thinking processes, mood, and memory has been observed. The diathesis stress model is used as an explanatory framework to illustrate how biological or psychological diatheses may interact with stress in the development of depression. 
It has been seen by using brain imaging studies that there is a lower metabolic activity in the prefrontal cortex in clinically depressed people. Psychodynamic treatments of depression has traditionally focused on helping the depressed person uncover and work through ambivalent feelings toward the lost object, thereby lessening the anger directed inward. Modern psychodynamic approaches tend to be more direct and briefer and focus on developing more adaptive means of achieving self-worth and resolving interpersonal conflicts. Cognitive therapists focus on helping depressed people identify and correct distorted or dysfunctional thoughts and learn more adaptive behaviors. Cognitive behavioral therapies have been very successful in treating major depression as they focus on helping people recognize when they are having dysfunctional thought patterns and correcting them. Going back to cognitive distortions, CBT helps with recognizing when someone is having a cognitive distortion and enables them to correct their automatic thoughts with a rational thought. One example is the automatic thought, nothing will ever work out for me. This would fall under the cognitive distortion of overgeneralization and a cognitive behavioral therapist would help a patient with realizing that this is a negative thought process and that they are blowing it out of proportion. The therapist would also help with coming up with a more rational thought, such as no one can look into the future, concentrate, on the present. Antidepressant drug use is on the rise as there are one in every 10 adults on antidepressant medication. When it comes to women aged 40 to 59, one in four are on antidepressant medication. It is theorized that one in four people suffer from or have suffered from a form of depression. There are four types of antidepressant medication that are readily in use. Tricyclics, increased brain levels of neurotransmitters norepinephrine and serotonin by interfering with the process of them being reabsorbed by the transmitting cell. MAO inhibitors increase the availability of neurotransmitters by inhibiting the action of monoamine oxidase and enzymes that normally break down or degrade neurotransmitters in the synapse. SSRIs work in a similar fashion to tricyclics by interfering with reuptake of neurotransmitters, but they have more specific effects on serotonin. SNRIs selectively target reuptake of both norepinephrine and serotonin, which increases levels of these neurotransmitters in the brain. It has been seen in research study after research study that combining psychotherapy and antidepressant drug use drastically helps with depression and has drastically lowered relapse rate back into depression because they learn coping skills. However, the downfall of this increasing antidepressant use is the availability. With antidepressants being readily available, less people are seeking out psychotherapy. Many people are looking for a quick fix, and medication is not a quick fix when it comes to depression or other mood disorders. When it comes to neurotransmitters, it's all a balancing act. Maintaining a balance of these important chemicals in the brain is critical for normal functioning, normal behaviors, normal states of consciousness, and so on. While some neurotransmitter imbalances occur without our knowledge, others result from chemicals that we ingest, like alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, pharmaceuticals, and caffeine. So how do various drugs affect the role that neurotransmitters play in the brain, and what short-term behavioral effects and long-term effects on brain function might we expect if we take them? Drugs can influence neurotransmitter balance in a number of ways. Often, they target the same site that neurotransmitters target, the receptors on the receiving or postsynaptic neuron. Drugs can influence neurotransmitter action in several ways, depending on their chemical makeup. If they act as agonists, they either increase the activity of a neurotransmitter or bind to the receptor in place of a particular neurotransmitter and stimulate the receptor. By doing so, they heighten the normal effect of the neurotransmitter. Drugs such as nicotine, morphine, and many tranquilizers act as agonists. Drugs that act as antagonists either decrease the activity of a neurotransmitter or simply block receptors without stimulating them. By doing so, they reduce or inhibit the action of neurotransmitters. Drugs such as caffeine, Botox, and Thorazine act as antagonists. Another class of drugs influences the action of neurotransmitters by preventing or slowing the reuptake process. Typically, neurotransmitters are released into the synapse and then taken back in if they fail to attach to a receptor site. 
but some drugs called reuptake inhibitors slow this process and as a result increase the amount of neurotransmitter available. Drugs such as Prozac and cocaine act as reuptake inhibitors. Mind-altering effects of psychoactive drugs take place at the synapse. Drugs attach themselves to synaptic receptors, interrupting the normal functioning of neurotransmitters. Drugs can affect normal brain function by keeping a message from being transmitted or by stimulating or prolonging a signal from one neuron to another. As an example, take smoking and nicotine. One of the reasons people find it so hard to quit smoking, despite its significant impacts on health, is that it not only mimics the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but it actually has a greater affinity for acetylcholine receptor sites. Under normal circumstances, acetylcholine stimulates receptors that make a person feel good when they've accomplished a task. Nicotine attaches to the same sites on the neuron and stimulates the same receptors as acetylcholine, in effect tricking the brain into thinking that the act of smoking is good or healthy, thus reinforcing a very unhealthy behavior. We've seen that while the brain is undoubtedly a physical organ, it changes significantly over the course of a person's life. What's more, so much of what takes place in the brain is influenced by chemicals, those that occur naturally and those that we ingest. The balance of those chemicals in the brain is critical to normal functioning and behavior. This is just one more way in which our choices and behavior can have powerful effects on how the brain functions. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is a hotly debated treatment for depression. However, evidence supports ECT as a generally safe and effective treatment for severe depression and shows that it can help relieve major depression, even in cases in which drug treatments have failed. It is estimated that there are 100,000 Americans that undergo ECT annually. However, ECT is only used as a last resort after all other attempts, such as drug use, is not effective. There may be side effects, especially memory loss for events occurring around the time of treatment and a high rate of relapse following the treatment. Bipolar disorder is most commonly treated with drugs that aim to stabilize mood swings, including lithium and other mood stabilizers. Lithium helps reduce mania and stabilize moods in bipolar patients and reduce the risk of relapse. People with bipolar disorder may be placed on lithium indefinitely to control their mood swings, just as diabetics may use insulin continuously to control their illness. The thing is, researchers are still not entirely sure how lithium even works. While there are benefits to treating bipolar disorder with lithium, there are many side effects that could occur. It may sound like a drug commercial if I were to list them all, but it could be ineffective, cause toxicity in the body, mild memory issues, weight gain, lethargy, and grogginess, as well as general slowing down of motor functioning. Long-term use can produce gastrointestinal distress and lead to liver problems. Although lithium is still widely used, the drug's limitation have prompted efforts to find alternative treatments. Anticonvulsant drugs used in the treatment of epilepsy can also help manic symptoms and stabilize moods in people with bipolar disorder. Suicide. It's never fun to talk about, but we must. Suicide is closely linked with mood disorders, especially major depression. Research has shown between 60 to 80% of all suicides are linked to a mood disorder. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. and second leading cause in college students. However, suicidal thoughts are common though, especially in times of great stress. Many people have fleeting thoughts of suicide. Luckily, a large majority of people who experience these thoughts do not act on them. Suicide is most commonly seen in middle-aged and older adults, especially males. Although women are more likely to attempt suicide, more men actually succeed, probably because they select more lethal means. The elderly, not the young, are more likely to commit suicide, and the rate of suicide among the elderly appears to be increasing. People who attempt suicide are often depressed, but they are generally in touch with reality. Other risk factors are Native Americans and Caucasians, previous attempts, and having to go through stressful life events. 
Remember, what you may find normal, someone may find stressful and vice versa. Just because you don't find a situation or life event as stressful does not mean someone else doesn't either. We all have different things we are vulnerable to, and if someone is vulnerable to something you are that you are not does not mean they are weak-minded. We all have different things we are vulnerable to, and if someone is vulnerable to something you are not does not mean they are weak-minded. It means that they perceive the situation or life events as more stressful. From the psychodynamic perspective, suicide is inward-directed anger. Sociocultural theorists attribute suicide to alienation and social isolation. According to learning theorists, people who attempt suicide lack problem-solving skills for handling significant stressors. Social cognitive theory focuses on personal expectancies and modeling, such as social contagion. Biological approaches focus on genetic factors and neurotransmitter imbalances. People who commit suicide tend to signal their intentions, often quite explicitly, such as by telling others about their suicidal thoughts. Research indicates that about 90% of people who commit suicide leave clear clues. They will tell others about their suicidal thoughts, but cloak their intentions, reveal a previous suicide attempt, sorting out affairs such as giving away their personal belongings, drafting a will, and buying a burial plot, purchase a gun despite lack of interest in guns, sudden peace because they feel relieved that soon they will not have to live with life's problems, and this is often misunderstood as a sign of hope. Substance abuse, financial problems, recent life crisis, medical problems, and relationship problems. Now, you may have experienced some of the factors in the past or even right now, but it does not mean you are suicidal, only you know that. But when these things all happen near each other in a short time frame, it is likely a person is having suicidal ideations and may even attempt really soon. To help with the prevention of suicide, please put this number in your cell phones. This is the suicide hotline number for the U.S. 1-800-273-8255. It is important to have this number readily available as you never know when you might need it. Well, this wraps up the lecture for chapter seven. Hope you enjoyed it. Learned something you didn't know. Didn't have any depression along the way about thinking what's going to be on the test. And I will see you in the next lecture. Ciao. Initial onset is the most common among you. What? I will provide, I will both major depressive, major depressive, and God, major depressive, said it again, depression. Examples of, of, of,